Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, first talk uh, after the uh, caffeine break. To introduce myself, uh, I'm Nish Parikh. I'm a researcher with uh, eBay Research Labs. And today, I'm going to talk about query suggestion at scale uh, with Hadoop. I will talk about our experience in uh, research and development around building a large scale uh, query recommender system. And I will also talk about our experiences along the way uh, using MapReduce over Hadoop to overcome some of the challenges which we faced while building the system. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with Gyanit Singh and Neil Sundresan here in the audience, uh, also from eBay Research Labs, and with Mohammad Al Hassan, uh, who is now at IUPUI. So I'm assuming that uh, eBay is not new to many of you. eBay is one of the world's uh, largest uh, marketplaces uh, with a user base of close to 100 million users. And with so many users interacting on the site, uh, terabytes of data is being generated daily uh, in the form of transactional and behavioral logs. And I'm re-emphasizing this again because the theme of the day today has been uh, big data, and we are dealing with big data at eBay. So at eBay Research Labs, uh, we are involved in conducting research which is closely tied to business, and the scientists at the labs, they are looking at these large data sets, uh, operating on this data, and we are trying to do large-scale computation in a scalable way. And we work on a diverse variety of things, uh, all the way from search and information retrieval to social incentive networks, and from computer vision to economics. And the application that I'm going to talk about today, the query suggestion system, uh, it bridges the gap between user behavior understanding, uh, query log analysis, and recommender systems. So some of you might be wondering, like, what are these query suggestions that Nish is talking about? So query suggestions uh, are an integral part of most search engines. And you might see them on different search engines, maybe on the right, on the left, top, or bottom. They might be called query suggestions or related searches. But the truth is they exist. And many of you must have used it at some point in time or the other. To give you some examples, if you look over here, and if you, this is an example when you search for the term Google on Google.com. And at the bottom of the page, Google allows you to narrow down your search to something more specific. Whereas on the left of the page, Google shows you alternatives to look at other search engines like Yahoo, Alta Vista, and Lycos. Um, I was surprised to see old search engines, but no Bing.com there. Uh, and it's, the example is from yesterday, so this is fresh data. Uh, these are examples from Bing.com when you search for Warren Buffet. Uh, these are examples from Yahoo when you search for some popular video game. And these do not exist only for web search. Here you see an example from Amazon.com where a user looks for Ansel Adams, and Amazon provides them an option to focus their search more towards posters or towards prints. So I'm going to walk you through as to how this system or this feature looks like on the eBay website. So on eBay.com, when a user searches for some term, uh, the recommendations are seen at the bottom of the search box. And the purpose of these recommendations is twofold. Firstly, it allows the user to kind of broaden or narrow their searches to become more focused, to be able to express their product intent better. Secondly, these kind of recommendations serve as a mechanism of discovery. They allow the user to explore a newer brands or products or alternative brands or products. So if you take the example of Xbox 360 here, um, eBay provides the user to focus their query towards games or consoles because the query by itself might be ambiguous and also provides the users an option to look at alternative things like PS3s or Vs. 
Now, what is the utility to the users here? Like on a marketplace like eBay, the vocabulary between sellers and buyers is very different. And if the buyers do not use the right terminology, they may miss out on getting the right inventory. And this feature helps the buyers bridge this gap. By clicking on some of these related searches, a user's path to success is shortened. If we see another example here where user is looking for uh, grizzly feather hair extensions. Um, this kind of queries might seem weird to some of you, but these are pretty commonplace on eBay. There are around 1,200 items that are found. And in addition to uh, providing options to narrow or broaden searches, there are also query suggestions like whiting feathers, and which could serve as exploratory recommendations to the user. The user may have no idea that by typing in whiting feathers, she is likely to get very relevant and interesting inventory. So this is a useful system. Uh, the question we were trying to answer was, how do we build such a system? There are various ways that have been proposed to build such systems in literature. And one of the oldest ways is agglomerative clustering. Um, it was described based on Lycos logs. And the idea is intuitive. Um, if, there is, if there are a couple of queries which lead to clicking on the same web page, then probably those queries are related. Other approaches have been described, like uh, linguistic and latent similarity measures. Like we could look at similar queries based on their textual similarity or some other similarity measures uh, based on factors in a latent space. With the availability of a lot of user information um, in recent time frames, uh, people have started looking at user information to build recommendation systems and ranking algorithms. And query flow graph is one such technique. So what is a query flow graph? So if I go to a search engine and say type in a query, Samsung TV, and then follow it with another query, Panasonic TV, then a query flow graph would capture these two query terms as unique nodes in the graph, and then have an edge between the two nodes indicating the transition. We use an approach which is similar to this because we find that it works well in practice and it's easier to scale as compared to the other approaches that I discussed. The other approaches discussed here, if naively implemented, would be of quadratic complexity. So what kind of data we look at? We look at a user information, the trails left by users in our logs. Here is one example trail um, where a user starts on the eBay homepage, and she's probably looking for covers for her Apple iPhone. She starts with a query Argyle Apple. She specializes it, views some products. After viewing the products, she goes back to her original query. She kind of adds a brand constraint. Then she relaxes the query, views a product, but ultimately is successful. And we, we look at these kind of trails as success trails. On another note, there are two users here who are starting with the same query, which is helicopter volitation, space parts cheap, which is kind of a verbose query. Uh, volitation helicopters are actually toy helicopters, and many people are coming to eBay to look for spare parts. The first user here does not find relevant items and tries to modify the query, but even after query modification, is unable to find the right inventory and exist the site. So this is an example of an unsuccessful trail. Whereas the another user is able to broaden the query and then find the item of her choice and purchase it. So this is again a success trail. So the idea we had was that why not look at this kind of success trails and build a query recommendation system? So if there is a query A, which is usually followed by query B, and it leads to success, then B could be a good recommendation for the first query. So how easy it is to build this recommendation system? Well, through our experience, we found that apparently it's not that simple. And there were various challenges uh, that we encountered along the way. The first challenge was processing large-scale data. So we took a small time period on eBay and started looking at the data. This data had a billion plus user sessions and several billion search queries in them conducted by say around 100 million users. And this was all spread across like terabytes and terabytes of data. So our first challenge was to be able to process this data and make sense out of it in a scalable and timely way. The second challenge was being able to clean the data. 
So we looked at those trails, and we get an idea that we can look at the successful users, or we can capture the wisdom of the crowds and build such a system. But what do our logs have? Logs do not have information only from successful users. Logs have information from robots and API calls and other tools and scripts, which we are interested in ignoring. Cleaning data is important. We need to fix the data. And it is clear by seeing an example over here. If you don't clean the data, you get some fuzzy correlation. Like for a calculator, we might end up, end up recommending a pocket knife. And we might end up recommending a fluke. Whereas if you use the same data, but we clean it properly, we get pretty interesting and relevant recommendations. That for calculator, we might recommend TI-84, which is a particular model, or the query adding machine. Arguably, eBay is also the king of long tail. So a lot of items on eBay are rare and one-off. Like, those items come on site and go away. Uh, looking at a recent example, uh, Prince Beatrice's hat, the hat that she wore to the royal wedding, it sold on eBay for $130,000. These kind of items come and go off eBay, and the queries on eBay are also rare. So eBay queries have a long tail, which we can see in the first graph here. And the irony here is when we ran experiments, uh, we figured out that actually query suggestions are more important for long tail queries as compared to head queries. So we had to cater to the long tail. And the only way to cater to the long tail is to look at more and more data. What's the fourth challenge that we faced? Well, a marketplace like eBay is pretty dynamic. Like 10 million new items are listed every day. Every 83 seconds, a jewelry piece sells. Every two minutes, a vehicle sells. So you get the idea. What is available on sale today may not be available on sale tomorrow. And our recommendation system has to adapt to these dynamics. We definitely do not want to recommend something which may not be available on site. So again, to reiterate, there are multiple challenges. Processing large data, fixing the data, catering to the tail, and also adapting to the dynamics of the marketplace. So how did we address these challenges? Well, it should be no surprise that we are presenting at this summit, and the power, fun, power of the elephant came to our rescue. At eBay Research Labs, uh, we have been an early adopter of Hadoop. Uh, we started out in 2007 hacking Hadoop 15 to make it work with our NFS. And at that time, we were toying with a four-node Hadoop cluster. Uh, today, we have migrated to using a 4,000-plus core cluster at eBay. In the process, we have also built a computation platform, uh, which we call Mobius, on top of Hadoop to process all these kind of behavioral information. This is the general architecture of the computation platform that I referred to. At the bottom, we see eBay data, the data that I talked about. It's uh, all the behavioral information captured from user activity on site. It's also transactional information about products being bought and sold. And all this is over HDFS. On top of HDFS, we have the 4,000 plus core Hadoop cluster. We have some APIs to access this data. But more importantly, we have a query language which sits on top of this API. We refer to that query language as Mobius query language. And for this particular application, we use this query language heavily to accomplish our task. And I will talk about it in a little bit more detail uh, just in a second. And at the top, we see various applications. So the computational platform supports a visualizer for looking at data, a metrics dashboard, and a lot of research projects, like the one I'm talking about, run on top of this platform. So Hadoop is the core at, um, for most of the things that we do. So why did we use the Mobius query language? So as I discussed earlier, uh, we are really interested in looking at what users are doing on site, how they are transitioning from page to page, uh, what kind of events uh, they go through. And we are interested in mining the trails left by users. Mobius query language uh, provides uh, seamless operators which can help mine such patterns from user trails. So let's take an example. Say we are interested in looking at all the user sessions where the users came in and performed a search. 
After a search, they did a bunch of other activity on site and then ended up doing another search, which led to a success. A success could be viewing a product or purchasing a product. If you wanted to find all such sessions, we could do it using uh, some pattern query in MQL, and it's just a couple of lines of code. So I will not go in the details of the language, but this is just to give you a flavor of why we use the Mobius query language to accomplish our task. So this is the logical flow of our algorithm or Hadoop, and this was implemented as a multi-process MapReduce flow. I'll be going to the details of the flow, but to just give you a high-level overview, we believe that data cleaning is very important. Um, what we learned from our experiments is just by cleaning data well, you can get around 5 to 10% improvement in a lot of performance metrics. So we, we lay a lot of emphasis on putting clean data and training based on as much clean data as possible. Once we have clean data, in order to build the recommender system, we are looking at query pairs. So we want to look at query co-occurrences which were beneficial to users on site. So say a lot of users started out with iPod but ended up buying a Zune. We want to capture this transition. And we want to calculate scores for this transition as to how important this transition was, what kind of benefits it brought to the user. So this is what happens in this step, and it is implemented in a MapReduce flow. Other thing that we calculate is, for some of these kind of query pairs, we try to calculate what's the semantic similarity between these queries. After we have all these scores, we try to do score normalization by user-based deduplication. We saw that these kind of things are also important to get good performance out of recommendation system. They take care of removing outliers. For example, we, we don't want a single user to be able to dictate the recommendations from our system. We wanted one user to be able to cast only one vote. Once we have the user deduplicate scores, we just compile the recommendations for all the queries. While compiling, we could rearrange the recommendations. We could do a good mix of generalizations and specializations and exploratory queries. And we could also incorporate diversity in the recommendation set. So I'll walk you through the details of MapReduce flow. And before that, I'll just talk a little bit more about data cleaning, because we uh, paid a lot of attention to data cleaning. So we did user bias removal, like removing robots and keeping only real humans, uh, deduplicating signals from users. We did platform bias removal, like to build a recommendation system for desktop and laptops. We don't want to consider data generated from iPhones and gaming consoles, because the interfaces there are different. And we also removed system biases. Like when you're looking at queries, queries typed in by users are actually different from queries that are generated by user clicks. And we want to differentiate these signals. So we also removed some system bias. Another thing that I would like to point out is uh, data preparation. Uh, while implementing these things over Hadoop, we learned that the way we prepare data for downstream processing can affect the computation time in a big manner. So for our jobs, uh, we are looking at user sessions. So we are interested in grouping all the activity in a session together. And forming sessions out of events or logs is not a trivial task. Like, there are a lot of things which go into session stitching, gathering all the events which should indicate one single session, how to expire sessions, and so on. So what we do is we pre-process all the data, gather all the user sessions, and then store them on HDFS. This uh, saves a lot of computation uh, time downstream. So this is our first MapReduce job, and the input to this job is this kind of sessionalized data. Once the data is fed to the mappers, the data is cleaned in the same way I talked about. Um, the data is normalized. We might want to treat synonymous queries uh, and merge the recommendations. And what we get here are query transitions. So original query, a recommendation query, and its scores. Scores could be different frequencies, how many clicks they led to or how many purchases they led to. What we do in the reducer is user deduplication. So a single user can cast only one vote. And we also do a compilation of these features that I talked about. So say we have views and purchases, but some heavy algorithms can be put in the reducer to 
to combine these views, purchases, and other information into a single score. Um, for most of our work, we have used linear combination of features based on some regression coefficients. The output of this job is the different query pairs and the scores for those pairs. And this is fed to the second MapReduce job in our flow. The mapper here is an identity mapper. The data flows to the reducer. And what happens here is aggregation of score over users. So the support for our algorithm is the number of users who exhibit the transition on site and benefit from that. So if you go from x to y, and if millions of users are doing it, then y is a good recommendation for x. So we really want good support for our recommendations. And when you look at large scale data, we do get good support for a lot of recommendations. However, for the tail or some queries for which we have sparse information, we may not have enough support. And in this case, we are not sure whether we should use that query transition as a recommendation or just prune and throw away that query transition. In order to get more confidence in these kind of transitions, we compute some other textual features for this query pair. We pushed the computation um, of these kind of features in our last reducer in order to reduce the number of computations we might have to make. So looking at this naively, say I'm looking at a billion queries, and I want to compute these kind of query pairwise features, the problem is intractable. Um, even if we looked at some optimizations, like inverted indexes or common terms in queries, we are still looking at around a trillion uh, computations. By moving this computation exactly where it's needed for only low confident transitions, we are able to compute it for only 200 million query pairs and save a lot of uh, computation time. So we really see a big advantage by moving this kind of heavy task to exactly where they are needed, where we have more intelligence as to for what query pairs we want to do the computation. And we get a lot of optimization by doing it. So what do we have at the end of this second MapReduce job? At the end of the second MapReduce job, we'll have all the query pairs which we want to use as recommendations, and we'll have all the scores associated with these query pairs. Once we have the scores and the query pairs, it's as good as a recommendation index. Um, we can just uh, compile this information. Once we have compiled this information, it can be used uh, on the eBay site in order to serve recommendations, the kind of recommendations that I showed earlier uh, below the search box. So I'll walk you through some of the results. Like, I won't be talking about all the results that we got. But we were able to run these algorithms for different parameters and settings, like different kinds of data cleaning algorithms or different ways to combine the behavioral features. And one thing that we observed consistently is, as we have a long tail, more data is always good. So as we use more and more data, we are able to surface recommendations for more and more queries. The other things that we learned are that data cleaning is extremely important. Just by focusing on better data cleaning algorithms, we can get an improvement, um, quite an observable improvement in performance metrics like click-through rate of the feature or purchase-through rate of the feature. Other thing that we learned is if we do better weighting of behavioral data, we can get improvements in the quality of the recommendations. So these are some of the results. So you know, to summarize, uh, what I have described here is query suggestion. So it's, it's, it's one application of log mining. But the, the beautiful thing here is the log mining algorithms in general are parallelizable. Like they are easy to map reduce and use on top of Hadoop. So by using Hadoop, like we were able to look at large data sets spanning long time intervals. And we are also able to do things very fast so that we could iterate and learn faster by running live on site. So the advantages are not only this application, but if user log mining is necessary for analytics or some other, other recommender systems, it should be easy to parallelize and do over Hadoop.
these are some of the references. A uh, lot of details around the algorithms and how we implemented them on top of Hadoop can be found in our wisdom paper. And some details around how we mine query relationships can be found in our Sikkim paper. And if you want to look at more details around our computation platform and the query language, we have a Hadoop World presentation. And to know more about Hadoop at eBay, we have some other online presentations. And finally, I would like to thank the Hadoop team at eBay as well as the search team at eBay for their support um, in helping us uh, experiment on the live site and making this research work succeed. And I would be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I had a question about the sessions. Yes. Uh, you talked about that it's a non-trivial problem. How did you go about solving it using Hadoop, or did you use Hadoop in doing that? So can you elaborate on that? Say that again. Can you elaborate on how you went about solving, uh, generating sessions through from the event logs? Right. So I can give you some details. So we have some complicated algorithms to stitch user sessions. So there is some published stuff on how to detect user sessions. Uh, we might want to look at fixed time intervals. So if a user has been inactive for 30 minutes, then we expire the sessions. Uh, that's one way to, to detect session boundaries. Um, when we are like trying to stitch sessions, there are also other intricacies, like we, ha we might be crossing day boundaries and so on and so forth. So the main optimization that we have done is we have put this kind of complicated logic in a MapReduce job. And this kind of session data is created daily and then stored in sessionized form on top of HDFS. And the main advantage that we get is when we run different applications downstream, we don't have to perform this operation over and over again. Uh, so I have a, I have a follow up question to that. Um, when you say you put the user data back in HDFS per session basis, do you actually <coughs> store a file for each user or how do you actually put the data back in there? Um, like so, do you create like th millions of files in there? Right. So it, it, it may not be millions of files. It, it's not a file per user. But at least it's guaranteed that a user session will be together. Like the, when the mapper reads data, mm -hmm. it will get the full session. That's the guarantee. I see. OK, so you are just avoiding recomputing it every time. Right. Okay. right. We don't want to do sessionalization every time we run these kind of jobs, because it's, it's not a trivial operation. 